Okay, welcome everyone. Shalom, praise the Lord, and thank you, um, online students, for joining our class. And welcome to our e learning students who will be listening to this lecture later on. Also, welcome to our in person students. Um, thank you for joining class this morning. We were studying chapter three last week. We began studying, uh, studying chapter three. We um, looked at the introduction and we came right up to verse, uh, verses 21 to 26. We'll continue from there. Uh, so we'll just pause before that for a word of prayer. Can one of you please lead us in prayer, please? Anyone? Father God, we thank you, Lord. We thank you and bless you for this time you have given us <clears throat> to be uh, fed with your word, Lord. Thank you, Lord, this uh, opportunity to learn your word and help, Lord, each one of us to understand and live that in our lives, Lord, and help it to be a help to others. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, so please turn with me in your Bibles and also in your notes, and you can look at, um, but you can look at your Bibles, Romans chapter 3, verses 21 to 26, okay? So just like a brief uh, introduction to Romans chapter 3 again, okay? In this chapter, Paul is basically asking rhetorical questions. So he's asking questions. It's also called rhetorical questions, rhetorical questions, because, you know, the the question is asked and the answer is very evident. The answer is in itself there. Okay. So Paul is very smartly asking these questions because he knows what is going to come up in the mind of the Jewish believers, the Jewish people. Okay, so he he looks forward, he knows, he understands, so he's asking the questions himself and he's answering it himself. So in chapter three, he almost asks seven questions and answers them. So he's he's asking and he's saying, hey, telling, asking the Jews and knowing the Jews will ask this question that, okay, you're saying that, you know, uh, the law is, you're going to be judged by the law. Okay, even though we have the law, we are uh, considered justified as sinners. So, you know, is the law useless? Okay, is it useless to receive the law? Okay, and so he answers that. And then he says, what happens if someone does not believe? Okay, does it change God? We looked at that, right? So it doesn't change who God is. God still remains the same. And then also he asked this question, is God unjust because he inflicts wrath? You know, if our wrongdoing is going to make God look good, then why is, you know, it's very unfair that he is punishing us for the wrong things that we are doing. Because the wrong that we are doing is actually portraying God as a God who is just, as a God who is good, as a God who is righteous. And then we use the example of Judas to understand that. And we also saw that God is just and that he's a God who judges sin. And um, Paul moves on to say that no one is perfect because all have sinned. So Jews, even if you have the law, that's not going to justify you. You know, you are sinners um, because you have not kept the law. You are not perfect. And he's telling the Gentiles, okay, you you don't have the law, but you have an inner law that's your conscience and your reason. And that also proves that you have also sinned because you are not perfect. So he comes to, he brings all of them actually so far. He's bringing them to this place that proving that they have all sin and of all have fallen short of the glory of God. There is no one who's righteous. There's no one who's perfect. And we all stand condemned before God. Okay. And no one can be justified because of the law. So that is where he is coming to. Because the Jews are saying, hey, we can be justified if you keep the law, if you follow set rules, follow certain rituals, if you follow certain the circumcision uh, sign, that is the sign of the covenant, if you follow that, then he says you can be just, they're saying that you can be justified by the law. So he's come to that place where he's brought all of them and said nobody can be justified by anything, but we can only be, and then he's giving a solution. He's giving an 
answer. He brings out a beautiful solution where he's saying that we all can be justified or we all can be made righteous by whom? By Jesus Christ. So how beautifully he is bringing them all to that point. Okay. So that is where we were. Uh, so can somebody again read verses 21 to verse 26, please? Verse 21 to 26. But now the righteousness of God apart from the law is revealed, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ to all and on all who believe, for there is no difference. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God set forth as a propitiation by his blood through faith, to demonstrate his righteousness because in his forbearance God has passed over the sins that were previously committed to demonstrate at the present time his righteousness that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Amen. So look at some of the few words that I repeated. What are the words that are constantly repeated here? Just, justifier, righteous righteousness okay so just justify justification justifier justly righteous righteousness righteously we said all this means the same thing because they all come from the same uh, root the greek word the same root word uh, from greek and it simply means what is right okay so we said that righteousness is a state of being right or the act of being what is right and just righteousness is also being in a state of which is approved and acceptable by god or acceptable to god and we also say righteousness is elsewhere used in the bible as you know doing what is approved and acceptable uh, to god okay so it's in a state of being approved and acceptable to god and it's also doing what is approved and acceptable to um, god okay so uh we we saw that in these verses you know uh is talking about god's righteousness okay what does it mean to be righteous doing what is right being blameless to be just okay or just to be faultless or blameless okay so righteousness of god basically means the faultlessness or the blamelessness of god and that he is a righteous god okay and that no one can find fault with him okay so that is what it means when we say that he is the righteousness of God, that, you know, the faultlessness or the blamelessness of God, that he's a righteous God and no one can find fault with him. Okay. So when we say that we are made righteous before God, it means what? That we are being made or brought to a position where God looks at us as though we are faultless or blameless before his eyes. Okay, that is what it means when it says that we are being made righteous before God. It basically means that we are given a position of being blameless and faultless in the eyes of God. Okay, so verse 21, he says the righteousness of God does not come through the, does not come through the law. Yes, it does not come through the law. So the ability to be blameless or the ability to be faultless before God does not come by keeping the law. Okay. And Paul is saying this was what the prophets also spoke. This is something they also foretold, you know, that God would do this. So what would God do? So he's going on to speak what God would do. Okay. Verse 22, where he says, you know, even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ to all on on all who believe, for there is no difference. So Paul is saying uh, here is that the whole world is guilty before God. Okay. And no one can be justified before God. No one can be righteous in God's eyes. 
Okay, but there is righteousness that God is giving to everybody without partiality. And what is that righteousness that God is giving to everybody without partiality, both to the Jews and to the Gentiles and to everyone? What is God giving to them? He's giving them his own righteousness. He's giving them the righteousness of God. Okay, so no one he's saying is righteous. No one can be justified before God. No one who has the law, who, you know, is able to follow some things of the law. No one can be made righteous and be made just. Okay, then how can the Jews and the Gentiles be made righteous? Is because we are made righteous with the righteousness of God. Okay, when we when Jesus's righteousness is imputed upon us okay and this righteousness is given to whom who is it given to to all who believe yes given to all who believe to all who have faith in christ jesus now how is this righteousness being made available through us to us through faith in whom in christ jesus okay so see how beautifully he's coming to the conclusion how beautifully is bringing a solution saying none of us are righteous none of us are just none of us are good even though we have the law you know but how are we made righteous before god because the law does not make us righteous but what makes us righteous in god's eyes is god's righteousness himself and this righteousness is made available to us through faith in whom christ Jesus. Okay. So here the righteousness of God means two things. The righteousness that comes from God. And what does it mean when we say that righteousness comes from God? What does it mean? Comes from God means? Yes, he's, some, he's the one who's giving us the righteousness. So the righteousness is God given. And the second thing is righteousness is belonging to God. What does it mean? Yeah, so belonging to God means that is something that is of himself. It's not something of inferior or secondary quality. It is something that is of himself. And remember how beautifully he says in verse um, 20, um, yeah, he's talking about God's righteousness. He says, verse 21, but now the righteousness of God apart from the law is revealed so he's talking about the righteousness of god and then he's saying hey we have this righteousness those who believe in christ jesus yes that is his nature yes righteousness is his nature thank you and those who believe in him would have this righteousness who have faith in jesus christ would have this righteousness made available to them okay so the righteousness of god means two things i repeat that again a righteousness from god something that is given to us by god and a righteousness belonging to god which means something that is of himself and not something that is inferior or a secondary quality now these mosquitoes have bitten me in my arm and my feet everywhere <laughs> nicely chewed me up okay we'll move on to verse 23 okay uh, can somebody read verse 23 please can no it's okay don't worry verse 23 can somebody read verse 23 you have a question nina no you can ask no problem oh, okay for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of god so here he says, he comes to his conclusion saying, hey, we have the righteousness of God, but all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. That means he's saying, we have all sinned and missed the mark of the glory of God. Why does he, why can't he just say, hey, we've all sinned before God? Why does he have to include the glory of God? Why? We should ask these questions. Come on, think. Why do you think he's, he could have just said, hey, we all have sinned? Because that is what he's bringing them all to the conclusion, right? He's saying, hey, we've all sinned, but, you know, we have the righteousness of God. 
So you can just say that. Why has he mentioned the glory of God here? Any thoughts? In Genesis, huh. like there they sinned and they lost. Okay, in Genesis, they sinned and they lost, lost the them. glory. Okay, okay, good. So in Genesis, we see that man was created why? In his image, to manifest the glory of God on this earth, right? He was created by God to carry and to display the glory of God. And when mankind sinned, what happened? It robbed them of this glory. They lost the glory of God. Okay. So we see that, uh, you know, man was originally created to carry and display the glory of God, but sin has robbed us of this glory. Okay. So, like I said, then so why does he mention about, why is he mentioning about sin and glory and everything over here? That you are not righteous, the law does not make us righteous. Why is he mentioning all these things here? Can you remember what I said in my introduction? The epistle of Romans, the letter of Romans is basically, what is the main thing that is there? It's talking about what? It's talking about the gospel of Jesus Christ. Remember, I said anyone who reads the epistle to the church at Rome or the, the book of letter of Romans, they would know the gospel of Jesus Christ, they would believe, and they would also know how to live their life. Okay, so that is the whole point, and that is why he's talking here. He's bringing us from, he's bringing the Jews from their context, the, the Gentiles from their context, and he's bringing them to the gospel of Jesus Christ. So see how beautifully he is uh, doing that. Okay, so uh, verse 24, can somebody read that please? Verse 24. Verse 24, being justified freely by his grace through the re redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Yes, it says this being made righteous, or we being made righteous, is freely by his grace. Okay, so he's saying, hey, this is a gift from God. It is given to us. Righteousness comes from God, not by keeping the law. It's from God. It's something that is of himself that he's giving to us. And he's saying that we have freely received it by grace, but you have to have faith in Christ Jesus. Okay. So he's saying in verse 24 that being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Jesus. Okay. So he's using a lot of Old Testament concept here in these verses. Okay. So he's talking about the word redemption and these uh, Jews knew the word redemption very well. Okay. He's saying it. we have received this righteousness uh, by grace through faith in Jesus Christ and we have received it through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Now, this word redemption in the Jewish mind had something of the idea of buying back, you know, or redeeming back from the slave market, or purchasing back, or buying back something with a price. So you have to pay a price and you have to buy it. So it's basically the, the whole concept of the word I, redemption had this idea of paying a price and buying something, somebody from the slave market or buying somebody out of the slave market. So the idea of redemption, you know, was basically paying that ransom price for somebody's freedom. You pay a price for somebody's freedom, you set them out from that slave market, or you bring them out of the slave market into freedom. Okay. So it's buying something back with a price and restoring something to its original state of freedom. And so that is why Paul is using this word redemption so beautifully here. He's saying the redemption that is through, that is in uh, Christ Jesus. Okay. So he's saying, hey, your redemption is bought by a price. And who paid that price? Jesus 
price. And what is the price he paid? He paid his own life. He gave his own blood. And he purchased us from what? The slavery of sin. And he has set us free okay so so beautifully he's just bringing in the whole gospel here and he's presenting the truth of the gospel um, uh, to them okay so he says so the righteousness of god is given to all who believe all who believe is all those who have faith in jesus christ and it is given freely and it we receive it by grace and he's saying that it is and he's giving it to us on the basis of the redemption that is in christ jesus jesus christ buying us with a price and restoring us to that original state which god created us to be now when god created us he created us in his image which means we were without sin we did not know any sin we manifested the glory of god we were to live forever we have a will we have a mind that we can understand god and that is who he created us to be but we had fallen from that state and we went into a state of being slaves and he says that we have been redeemed back and purchased back to our original state what is our original state what is our original state? Living without sin, which he's going to talk about in chapter 6, where he says, you know, the power of sin is broken over our lives. We are no more under the dominion of sin. The power of sin is totally nullified, broken over our lives. So see how he's, you know, building it up. And then he's saying that we are also brought into freedom. So since sin is broken over our lives, sin has no authority, sin has no power, you know, we are no longer under the slavery of sin. But now we, he says in, in chapter 6 going on, he says, now we are slaves of righteousness. Okay, that means we are now belonging to righteousness. We are no longer slaves of sin. So how, how beautifully he is, you know, bringing it all together and how he beautifully is building it up okay verse 25 can somebody read that verse 25 whom god set forth to be propositions by his blood through faith to demonstrate his righteousness because in his forbearance god had passed over the sin that were previously commanded committed, committed. Yes. Thank you. Amen. And so he's saying about Jesus, he's saying whom God set forth as a propitiation by his blood. Okay. Now the uh, word propitiation in the Greek is translated. Anyone knows what is translated as? What does the word propitiation in the Greek mean? Anyone knows? It's translated mercy seat. Okay, and where do we see this mercy seat? In the tabernacle, okay, the Ark of the Covenant, yes. So this in English is translated propitiation uh, with an uh, attempt to capture what happens at the mercy seat. So God sent Jesus Christ as our mercy seat seat now what does mercy seat mean we know that the ark of the covenant is placed in the tabernacle in the holy of holies and we see that every year the high priest one of the high priests is chosen and he takes two uh, goats one becomes a sin bearer and the other one becomes a sin offering the sin offering, the blood is taken and sprinkled all over in the tabernacle. The sin bearer, the sins of the people of Israel is placed on it and sent out into the wilderness. And then the, the chief priest also makes a sacrifice for himself. And he enters into the holy of holies. And he takes this blood that was sacrifice of that lamb. And as soon as he goes into the holy of holies, what does he do? The first thing he does is he takes that blood and he sprinkles it on that mercy seat. Now, where is the mercy seat? On the Ark of the Covenant, the cover, there are two angels sitting there. In between is that mercy 
uh, seat. Okay, and that is the place. You know, when he's sprinkling the blood, he's saying that blood is made atonement for our sins. That means the blood has covered the sins of the Israelite race, and that is why you know God says when that blood is atoned, the sin is atoned for. That blood sacrifice is made. God says. You know, I will meet with you. Okay, it's a sign of a man being reconciled to God. That means God, people could not enter the holy of holies. Even the priests could not enter the holy of holies. But when He takes that blood that is made the atonement for the sin, and He sprinkles that, God says, "Okay, now sin is atoned for." And He says, "God says, I will meet with man." Because of that atonement sacrifice, because of that blood, I will be able to meet with man, and man is able to meet with God because of that sacrifice that is made. Okay, so the propitiation is an attempt to capture the atonement at the mercy seat. That man, you know, when he comes there in that mercy, the mercy seat, and he sprinkles that man is being made righteous with. God, how is a high priest made righteous with God because of that blood sacrifice? That means he has a right standing with God, and man is able to meet with God because God is going to come and speak to that high priest, which does not happen otherwise, right? It happens only at that time. So man is being made righteous with God. That's why he's able to come and stand in the holy of holies, and you know, man is able to meet and speak with. God. So Paul is saying that hey, Jesus is that mercy seat. So you see how beautifully Paul is speaking here or bringing the Old Testament concept of um, atonement, propitiation, the sacrifice, everything, because it was so well known to the Jewish mind. Okay, they knew all of these things, and so he's connecting the connecting the dots, so to say, and he's saying, hey, Jesus is that high priest. He is. You know, he's become our mercy seat. He's become that place where atonement was made, and because of his atoning sacrifice, because of his blood that has made the atonement, now man has been reconciled to God, and that's why he's saying, "You have been made righteous. You have been made just. You have your sins has been." Atoned for. It's not the law, but it is Jesus Christ, His blood, which is blameless, which is righteous, which is faultless, which was made for as the atoning sacrifice for our sins. And because of that, man is reconciled with God, and man is brought to a place where we are blameless and faultless and made righteous before God. Okay, isn't that beautiful? Okay. So verse twenty-five, he says, "Whom God set forth as an propitiation by His blood through faith, to demonstrate His righteousness, because in His forbearance, God has passed over the sins that were previously uh, committed." Okay. So he's saying in verse twenty-five, this whole thing about the propitiation of what Jesus' blood has done has made atonement for our sins, demonstrates God's righteousness. Okay, so something very, very important here. Okay, Paul is saying in the past God overlooked sin, which means not that he he did not condemn sin, but he did not pour out his judgment on sin right then and there. Why didn't he do it? Because he reserved it to be poured out on the cross. And when doing this, he's saying God is righteous. Okay, so many of you ask this question. Hey, when so and so sin, why didn't God not punish him? Okay, when so and so sin, God immediately showed punishment. But why, you know, sin? Uh, why we people who have the grace of God, you know, or living in this time where we are not immediately judged and punished like the Old Testament people? Why? Because it says. Paul is saying, in the past, God overlooked sin, which means He did not pour out His judgment on sin. Why? Because He reserved it to be poured out here on the cross. In doing so, He's saying God has been righteous. He's been righteous in doing what He has done. That He has not 
you know, uh, 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 poured out the judgment on sin, but he has kept that judgment of sin. He's poured it all on his son on the cross who made that propitiation, that atonement for our sins. Okay. Any questions, any doubts? No? Okay. I hope you are, are enjoying what Paul is, uh, the deep truths that he's bringing out. Verse 26, can somebody read that, please? <clears throat> to demonstrate at the present time his righteousness that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Oh. Oh, sorry. Okay. Can you hear me now? Okay. Um, so we are in verse uh, 26, where Paul is saying, you know, God, God is righteous. Uh, why is he saying God is righteous? He's saying God is righteous because he has judged sin. Not only is he righteous because he's judged sin on the cross, but he's also the justifier of those who have faith in Jesus, which means God is saying, hey, I have judged sin, hence I'm a righteous God, but I'm also able to justify those who have sinned because their sins have been judged in the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. So he's saying God, hence, is both the just and the just for you. That means just means he's justified sin on the cross and justifier means He's justified you and me because he has justified our sin on the cross. He's judged sin on the cross through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Okay. So Paul is basically saying that God can be both the judge, the one who condemns sin, and the one who also forgives sin because of what he has done on the cross. Because Christ being made our mercy seat and because our redemption is in Christ Jesus. So God is both righteous or just and the justifier means God is just in judging sin and God is also just in acquitting the sinner. Why is God just in acquitting your sin even though you have sinned? Because the punishment has already been paid on the cross. The redemption price has already been paid on the cross and is able to do this, he's able to justify us who are sinners and he's able to judge sin because of what was done on the cross. Okay, so having said this, Paul is making a conclusion, he's going on to say what he really wants us to know. Okay, so we'll move on to verses. Um, 27 to 31. So can somebody please read that, please? 27 to 31. Where is, where is worsting then? It is excluded by what law of works? No, what, why the law of faith? Therefore, we conclude that a man is justified by faith apart from the deeds 
of the law or is he the god of the jews only is he not also the god of the gentiles yes of the gentiles also since there is one god who will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through faith do we then make void the law through faith certainly not on the certain on the contrary we establish the law amen so um any uh, any one of you have any doubts about what we studied in the previous verses nikhil any doubts about what we studied in the previous verses are you all able to understand what paul is meaning by the righteous god by being a just god and the justifier any questions online students i hope you all are understanding yes no okay thank you chaya okay if you are able to understand we'll move on to verses 27 to 31 okay so here he asked three questions in verse 27 verse 29 and verse 31 okay verse 27 he says where is the boasting then okay so he's asking another rhetorical question where is the boasting then that means he's telling the jews you know why are you boasting about the law because our righteousness is not from the law it's through faith in christ jesus and what he's done on the cross our redemption our propitiation everything is coming through jesus christ then why are we boasting about the law why why are we boasting about the sign of the physical sign of the covenant that is circumcision and then he says it's excluded the boasting is excluded by what then he's asking another question by what the law or of works and then he says no but by the law of faith so he's saying not the law that is the physical law that has been given the torah but he's saying the law of faith okay so he's saying so he's basically asking the jews or the jews are thinking okay now righteousness is by grace through faith it's what jesus has done on the cross then the jews will be thinking what's the use of the law and then now what do we do with the law what about the works that means what is the work about the signs of the the circumcision the covenant we were doing all these years now what what about all of this then what about the boasting then so paul is saying hey no one can boast no one can take credit for them selves we cannot boast the law and the works and he says no one can boast because now everything is by faith okay everything is by faith so how is the boasting excluded by faith okay the boasting is excluded because of the law of faith okay so he's basically now guiding them slowly into what he's going to be discussing in the next part of his letter which for us is chapter 4 so which is talking about faith in chapter 4 he's slowly beginning to discuss that and present that here okay so in verse 28 he's presenting the conclusion okay in verse 28 he says therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith apart from the deeds of the law so he's coming he's bringing all this and he's bringing a conclusion and saying hey it's not by you cannot be justified by keeping the law but it is by faith okay by uh, uh, grace through faith okay and so he's making the conclusion that man is justified or made righteous by faith and he says man is put in right standing with god he is made faultless blameless before god by faith and it's not dependent on the deeds of the law or doing things of the law then was 29 he asked another question or is he the god of the jews only is he also not the god of the gentiles okay so he's asking this question okay and he answers by saying yes he is the god of jews and the gentiles okay so paul says the god gave the law and the covenant to the jews first but he is also the god of both the jews and the gentiles okay and then verse 30 he says since there is one god who will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through faith 
Okay, so he says both the Jews and the Gentiles be justified by what? Faith. Whether you are circumcised Jew or you are uncircumcised Gentile, you are going to be judged by your faith in whom? Christ Jesus. It's your faith that is going to uh, justify you or going to be made, you are going to be made righteous before God. So this was the main thing that he was getting to. And then he says, okay, if we are justified by faith and not by keeping the law by works and justify, justified by faith in Christ Jesus, then look at what he says in verse 30. Do we then make void of the law through faith? That means, what is he saying? He's basically thinking of what the Jews will be thinking when he's writing all this. So he's saying, hey, so Paul, I, the Jews will ask, be thinking uh, and asking Paul this question in their mind. So is the law empty? Is it useless now? It's, is it nullified? Is it of no use? Okay. And then he says, what is the use of the law? He's saying we are not making void of the law. We are not saying the law is useless. Making void means we are not saying that the, the law is useless. But on the contrary, Paul says, we establish the law okay so it can be a little confusing for them how is paul saying we are establishing the law when he's saying that hey the law is not going to justify us the law is not making us righteous okay it is what is making us righteous and just uh, justified before god it is by grace through faith and then here he's saying okay the jews will be asking the question so is the law of no use? Is it useless? But he's saying certainly not. He's saying very surely. Certainly not. The law is not useless. But he says on the contrary, we establish the law. So how do we establish the law? Because we have said, he has already mentioned, I, I, I told you last class, in the beginning of chapter 3, he says, no one can keep the law. So Paul has proved that in chapter 2, chapter 1, chapter 2, he's proved it that, hey, none of us can keep the law. And that's why he's saying you can't judge anyone. Why? Because you yourself can't keep the law. And then he's already told us that we are all sinners. And um, so he's saying, hey, the law serves a purpose. What is the purpose of the law? What is the purpose of the law? Yes, the law shows us when we have sinned, when we have fallen short of the standard of God, when we have broken his uh, ways or his laws. So the law exposes that we are sinners. Only when we break the law can we know, hey, we have broken this law and so we have sinned against God. And when we have broken the law and we have sinned against God, it proves that we are guilty. Yes or no? We stand guilty before God. Okay. Now, he says, the same sin that the law has condemned, God has condemned in the person of Jesus Christ. Amen? So beautiful, right? He's saying, the law condemns us. The same law that has condemned sin, God has condemned it in the person of Jesus Christ. Okay, so he has judged it in the person of Jesus Christ. And through that, God can justify people who have faith in Christ Jesus. So he's saying, in effect, the faith has actually established the law. Are you able to understand? Okay, so he's saying, actually, in effect, the faith has established the law. Yes, the law condemns sin. God condemns sin in Christ Jesus. And when the sin is condemned, and when we have faith in Christ Jesus, in effect, our faith has established the law. Okay? So he comes, he's bringing us all to this place where he says, you need to have faith in Christ Jesus. So faith is not telling us that the law is not necessary. No, we shouldn't think that way. Faith does not mean that, hey, I have faith in Christ Jesus, so that means I don't need the law. Okay, that's wrong. That's not what Paul is saying. Paul is saying faith comes in because the law was there, but we were unable to keep the 
law. We couldn't match up to the law. You know, our works fell short of the requirements of the law. So faith had to come in. How else can we be justified? Because we can't keep the law at any time, right? And the law is not going to make us justified before God. So what is going to be made? Uh, son, he's saying the solution is Jesus Christ. Sin was condemned in the person of Jesus Christ on the cross. And so he's saying faith had to come in. Okay, Faith is not doing away with the law, but faith is fulfilling the law. Because when we have faith in Christ Jesus, that is going to justify us. That is going to make us righteous, righteous. And the law cannot condemn us because we have been made righteous in God. Okay, So he's saying faith is saying that this is the whole purpose that the law showed us that we could not do things on our own strength. We could not keep the law. Okay, In our own way, we could not be made righteous by keeping the law. So it is through faith. So when through faith we believe in Christ Jesus, who condemned sin, and in that result, you know, the law was also established. So also he's saying that, you know, uh, righteousness is through faith. You're able to understand? So he's saying that faith in effect has established the law. So everyone has come to this place where they have faith in God, saying that, hey, yes, we agree, we cannot keep the law. Okay, so what is that is going to save us? It is only faith in Jesus Christ because he has condemned the sin and so we are no longer condemned. So he's saying we are establishing the law, we are affirming the law that yes, we can keep it. How can we keep it? Through faith in Christ Jesus. So faith has established what the law has been telling us that we have fallen short of the glory of God and so this is what he concludes with. Isn't it uh, very theological, very, but how beautifully Paul just presents it and brings that argument. Just look at how he's reading the mind of the Jews, how he's asking the questions and how he's beautifully bringing it. Finally, he's saying, hey, it's not the law that is done away with, but it is you know, the law has been established. And how has it been established? Because sin has been condemned in the person of Jesus Christ and also in us. By law, we know the purpose and what is right and wrong. Yes, yes. The, the law shows us what is right and wrong. Yes, the law shows us what is sin and what is not sin. The law shows us when we have sinned. Hey, we have sinned. We have broken the law. We have done what is wrong. And the law also shows us what is right. Yes. But in our own strength, we were not able to keep the law. And that was the problem with us. And uh, that is why God sent his son who, you know, condemned sin on the cross and hence he established the law. So through faith, law is established. Okay. Very interesting way Paul is bringing out his, uh, the reasoning, the argument here so beautifully so that the Jewish people can read and understand. Any questions? I hope you all understood. It's not gone out of your mind or it's a big puzzle. <laughs> that you're trying to understand. Yeah? Able to understand? So see how beautifully brings everything in the end. You know, law, uh, uh, righteousness of uh, Jesus Christ, what he has done on the cross, and, uh, you know, that we are made righteous by grace through faith. Okay? Okay, and no questions? Anyone has any doubts? Okay. I hope you enjoyed chapter 3. I enjoyed it thoroughly. <laughs> Again, teaching it. Such powerful truths and so wonderfully Paul brings it out. Okay, thank you everyone for joining class. If there's no questions, we'll stop here and then we'll continue with chapter 4 tomorrow.